you're here, and uh, we're glad to have Brother Patterson back with us tonight. Pray for him. He's had uh, surgery, and uh, he's going. He's facing more surgery, and I hope you'll lift him up in prayer. Uh, he's been consistent down through the years, helping people in need, and I pre I've appreciated his ministry through the years and. He's coming tonight. I always tell people I'm glad to see him. For one time in my life, I feel like a little small boy when he's when he stands up. I'm usually a good sized fella, but uh, when he stands up, I feel like. In fact, uh, I'm not going to say it, but uh, I'm glad to have him tonight. Let's welcome Brother Patterson to the pulpit. Damn it. We're in negotiations. <laughs> hey, you got to buy a five out of these. Uh, <laughs> hey, 915, come on. <laughs> well, I would stand up and preach, but I, it's, uh, it's a different pain. I got in a car wreck. Two cars hit me. A lady driver hit me. But a guy hit her, so. And it uh, tore up my spine. But it's a miracle that I'm walking. And... Uh, so I come up with this concoction. My wife bought it, and I like it. <laughs> How's that look like Humpty Dumpty up here? <laughs> laugh. I'd laugh at you. I, I, I love life. I squeeze it. I heard old preachers say one time, either you squeeze life or it'll squeeze you. And we're going to be out of 2 Samuel 18 tonight. And uh, I have been busy. I, at night, my mind floods back. Miss Lori's talking about them girls. You know, I had a girl's home for about 12 years. And uh, I got more, I got more, um, more accomplished with my girls than I did with my, my boy. My boys are lazy, and uh, girls they want to they want to go there and get it done and go home. Hello, my guys they want to see how good they are, how big their muscles are, and all that jazz. And uh, but my girls out eat my guys. Oh yeah, so three to one. And uh, but I want something done. I got the girls to do it. And uh, the guys, how come you don't use us and uh, so forth. But anyways, I enjoyed that middle. I guess we're going to stand tonight, 2 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a very tender subject. I, I didn't know Miss Harvey was going to be here tonight. It'll, it'll affect her ministry. But uh, somewhere between the car and this pulpit, I dropped, lost two pairs of glasses. So I'm in the borrowing ministry tonight. And here's I'm going to talk to you about a little truth tonight. What Absalom never heard David say about it. David said something about Absalom. And what we're dealing with is Absalom's out here on these streets and these, and these churches and these homes. And, uh, but I just want to encourage you tonight, and uh, you may want to call it the art of helping people. I never hurt people, but you hurt them, but you help them. And uh, whatever, what, whatever, I like what uh, Miss Lawyer's talking about money and raising funds here. Brother Olaf used to say, why is it people with money have no vision? And people with vision have no money. Uh, money is ministry, helping people. And I don't, I don't go around, my name is Jimmy, and take all you give me. I earn my money. I work for it. And uh, I did on the streets. And I was on the streets, I, I served hard. I sold drugs. I stole cars. I stole trains. I was wearing the gangs of Detroit. I'll tell you a little bit about that tonight. But the Lord changed me at the age of 18. Metamorphically, I got changed on the inside. And my things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. But the memory's still there. And you got to fight that every day till the day you get your brand new body. That's why it's okay. I try to tell my young people, get your mind clean as quick as you can and keep it clean. Because that old flesh, it, it, don't, it, it didn't get saved. <laughs> that old flesh, you still got those mistakes you got in your life coming out of jail and, and uh, doing your things. I got a guy calling me. About the third time he called me, he's from the mental ward. He's, he, he want to know, can he, can he, he's hearing voices and talking to people. He's probably listening to me right now tonight. And I told him, I'm going to find you a home. He keeps yelling, I want to come with Jack Patterson. I, was, I, I never met this guy. But uh, my, he touched my heart. He's crying out for help. Hmm. And uh, I'm going to find a place for him. But I'm over here in 2 Samuel chapter 18, this time of the year. And I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. I know what the, what, what's going on, the election, and what's going on behind the scene. 
Politics, poly means many and ticks means bloodsuckers. So what are you, who are you for? Well, some of my friends are for it and some of my friends are against it. I'm for my friends. <laughs> and, uh, but I, uh, my dad was a Jimmy Hoffa boy. He was a Democrat, but he voted for Barry Goldwater, a Republican. And, um, but, I, uh, but I got saved and uh, I, I read the scripture and we'll preach and then uh, we'll have church and preachers going to feed me. Second uh, Samuel chapter 18, verse one. And David, numbered, and David numbered the people that were with him and set uh, the captains of thousands and over, uh, over them. And I'll give you the context. His boy's in trouble. The king's son's in trouble. And David is going to tell these thousands of people how to treat his boy when they find him. And I'm going to bring it down where we live at tonight. Uh, and David set forth the third part of the people under the hand of Joab. Now, Joab was his uh, George Patton. That was his warrior. He was a go-getter. I like, I like Joab, but sometimes he got out of bounds. Okay? Sometimes Christians get out of bounds. You got to get back in line. That's why God gave you a pastor. I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I drive a van. I'm an evangelist. Amen? Amen. You'll catch that later on, okay? And David sent forth the third part of the people under the hand of uh, Joab and the third part under the hand of uh, Abishai, the son of, uh, uh, boy, I'm missing a word. Dude. I'm, I'm not taking from the King James Bible. Uh, under the hand of Abishai, the son of uh, Zariah, Joab's brother. And then the third part, under the hand of Ateah the Gittite. I like this guy, Ateah. He told him one time, he told David, he said, whether you go up or whether you go down, I'm sticking with you. And that's what this pastor needs right here. That's what Miss Laurie needs. So, uh, need, need someone to go, what, when you're going to have bad days, stick with them. You're going to have good days, stick with them. Now, he don't know what I'm preaching on, so... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be a blessing to people. This is a, this is a message to the church and uh, human nature. I preach this uh, often around the country, but I felt like I need to preach it here tonight. And, the, and, the, and uh, verse number four, and the king said unto them, what seemeth you best I would do? They wanted him to go off the battle, and he told the king, you ain't going to battle in case you get hit. And uh, later on, and the king stood by the place, and all the people came, and by the hundreds and thousands, now verse five, and the king commanded commanded Joab. He, went, he shot at him first. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Atei, deal gently for my sake with a young man, even with Absalom. And, and the people heard when the, when the king gave all the, the charge concerning Absalom. Our Father, I pray that you'll bless the reading of your word. I want to thank you for your goodness. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, here's an amazing story. I'll tell you the story, then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the insert. Absalom was a rebellious boy, and he sent the barley fields on fire. He sent Joab's barley fields on fire. Billy Kelly has a sermon on that, uh, burning, burning, uh, burning the, the barley field. And uh, I, uh, I, grew up in, I grew up in the streets of Detroit as a lost boy, but I grew up in the South as a saved man. So there was a, there was a, a great contrast. Uh, I had no respect for authority. I had no respect for my parents. I had to learn that when it came south. Went down to Georgia, and my sister gave me the riot act. And I had a sister. You didn't mouth off to her. She changed your life. And uh, she, had, she, had a left, she had a lazy lip and an overhand right. And uh, I was 15 years old, and she frequently uh, tore up my head in Jesus' name. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about something very delicate tonight. And so what I'm talking to you about tonight is, is what happened is in this chapter that uh, 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 Absalom got killed by Joab's 10 men. They shot arrows at him. And they killed this young man. But I want to take the threes and, and, and tell you what, 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 what David asked the young man to do for him. He said, when you, find, when you find my son Absalom, I want you to deal gently with him. I want you to deal gently with him for my sake. That's one of the greatest pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. David was the most type of Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, uh, dealing gently with him. And uh, just like you want people to deal gently with you and, and your son, your child, your grandson. And uh, as I was telling you about how I grew up, my, my father worked for Mr. Hoffa. I met Mr. Hoffa about two or three times. I was about 9, 10, 11. Very jovial, upbeat kind of a guy. I know where's the joke, where's Jimmy Hoffa's body at. I remember when I had this operation, I woke up, I was kidding with the Lord. I said, Lord, if you heal my legs, I'll tell you where Jimmy Hoffa's body's at. And um, he leaned over and said, I know where he's at, Jack. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, long story short, uh, uh, 
uh, David, David gave out that decree, and they didn't, they didn't deal gently with them. And uh, dealing gently with, with God's people and trying to help them, you're going to come across people from all walks of life and how to help them. This morning, I was checking out the motel. I preached for uh, uh, Brother Tucker this morning, and I was checking out the motel, and I had a walker and carrying my suitcase out there. And my wife got me one of these psychedelic shack suitcases. It looked like from the 70s. And uh, you can see it a mile away. And I said, why do you got it so bright? Do you get the picture? Can you spot it? On, can you spot your, your, your suitcase? You can't lose this food suitcase. <laughs> and uh, everybody said, where'd you get that suitcase? My wife bought it. <laughs> and um, so I, I use it as much as I can. And, uh, but as I was walking out, a young girl said, can, let me get that suitcase for you, uh, preacher. I was, was witnessing some people there this morning. And as I, on the way out to the car, I said, uh, ask her about her salvation. I said, well, are you in church anywhere? She said, well, I used to go to so-and-so Baptist church, but I, 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 don't, I don't live for God no more. The next words out of my mouth made me preach this tonight. I said, you know, the Lord loves you. He wants to be your friend. You need to hang with the right crowd. And she said, you're going to go preach at a certain, certain church. And she named the church I, I preached this morning. I said, won't you get back in that church? And as I was getting in the car, she said, you're a nice guy. I just looked at her. I said, well, about 49 years ago, I wasn't a nice guy. But the Lord Jesus Christ, where the lamb came inside a dog and turned me into a sheep. That's what happened to you. Hey, and that's what happened to you. <laughs> the lamb came in the dog nature that you, you have it. Oh, yeah, he's there. And every once in a while, he wants to come alive. And, uh, and she said, you know what? I think I need to get back in church. And I said, well, that's your business. I just want to encourage you. I tried to give her a tip. She wouldn't take it. And uh, there's brokenhearted people all over the place. I'm talking about on work. I'm talking about your grandson. I'm, uh, the Thanksgiving holidays, the Christmas time's coming up. You're going to meet people from all different walks of life and uh, try, try, try to reach them. And, uh, and what are you saying, preacher? Uh, I, get, I get people who come across, I got to learn to deal gently with them. Sometimes I don't want to be gently. I want to delegate it. That's the easiest way to get out of something. But man, no, that's what God called you to do, to help you out and to be, be kind with them. But Absalom never knew that David had forgiven him. They killed him. And we're going through the Christian life. I'm trying to encourage you today. This, this, uh, this holiday is the most depressing time of the year. It's the most suicidal time of the year. Amen. And uh, they need people to, to do someone to be kind to them. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even ask God for Christ, he can't forgive you. Oh, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even ask God for Christ, he can't forgive you. My niece is Joe Arthur's secretary out of Georgia. Her mother just died. That was my oldest sister. She pulled me out of jail, pulled me out of a juvenile detention home, stealing cars, stabbing, robbing, all that stuff. When I was 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. On her deathbed, she called me in. She said, Jack, Jack Patterson, get in there, boy. <laughs> and when she said, boy, she meant get in there. I walked this about five years ago, and I said, I'm Dr. Patterson. I said, you ain't no doctor to me. You're my punky brother. And I got in there, and I was laughing at her and kissing her on the cheek. And uh, she said, Jackie, I'm dying. Quit kissing me. I said, well, you're my sister. I'm going to kiss you all I want to. You can't do nothing about it. And I had her laughing, and she said, I want you to do something for me. I want you to look after my grandson while I'm gone because you owe me. You owe me. And I want you to take care of that for me. Then she said, now get out of the room. I'm tired. I'm taking a nap. There's nothing. She did not say things appropriately. She put the cheese on the pizza. Oh, she was a very kind lady. But she lived a rough life. Had boys on the street tonight with a girl that's not his wife. He's called me about four times a day, four or five times. He said, Uncle Jack, I'm in a motel. I'm running out of money. I bought him one the other night. I said, so-and-so, I'm not going to call his name. I said, so-and-so, I'm going to help you. But I got to get a place for that lady to go. Well, I'm bringing her with me. I said, no, not, not, you can't do it right now, but I will help her, then I'll help you. You promise? I said, yeah, I'll help you. He looked at me, he looked at me a couple of weeks ago and he said, Uncle Jack, he said, why are you always helping me? I said, because somebody helped you many years ago and you never knew anything about it. I said, your grandmother was my best friend, my older sister. When my sister was uh, uh, 1965, she was 30 years old. A fire took place in Detroit. 
and her son and daughter were burned alive in the fire. They were five and six years old. That was Johnny and Linda Sorrell. Those are my those are my my my, my bloodline curse order. This is my second my second nephew here, and uh, and I and I, I said glad he had this hurt all of her life. And you see, preacher, what, what, you you want to help these people from all walks of life? How do you help them? How do you help them? Well, look what the, the text said: deal deal gently, deal gently with the lad for my sake. So I go through the Christian life sometimes and trying to help people. And uh, the Lord said, hey, uh, you're going to deal with them. You're going to work with them. But I want you to do it for me. My motive has got to be for Jesus Christ. My, uh, Pastor Beatty's motive has got to be for Jesus Christ. Miss Lloyd's motive to help these young girls is for Jesus Christ. You're, if your motive changed for wrong, you're going, to have, you're going to have some bad experiences. But you keep the things pure. And I want to help that boy. Lester Roloff said, if you're breathing, you're reachable. And I want to find that young man, find that young girl. And I, I, I want them more than just getting saved. I want them sold out. I want them productively doing something for the call of the Christ. I don't want to just get saved. Uh, there's more to the Christian life than just getting saved. More to the Christian life than just reading your Bible. They try to activate your faith, activate your Christianity, and do something with your Christian life. There's people all over this world, even in this town, been saved by the blood of the Lamb, washing the blood, saved by the Holy Ghost, and doing nothing for God. You know what? They've been redeemed, but they're doing nothing with their Christianity. Far smarter than I, far richer than I, and but yet they sit back and take it yawning. There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming. There's a bright... You'll never burn, but there's going to be something at the great judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible said, hey, whatever you do, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put your works and see if they go through the fire. I want to take something home for Jesus Christ. And he gives me a formula here, Dr. Beatty. I got to deal gently with them. Woo! Sometimes I don't want to, I run out of patience. I, I want to say, get it, man, get it. Get in something and do something with your life. And he said, no, he said, deal gently with them. It's the same word as a doctor, a nurse would use in the hospital. Nurse, we get our worst nourish from that word. My friend, Dr. Bill Grady, thinks he's an intellect. And uh, one of the guys that got me saved was Dr. Pete Ruckman. He was telling Dr. Ruckman how smart he was, and God's using him. He's using his books. And Dr. Ruckman went like this. Uh, I've heard enough of that junk. He said, let me tell you why God's using you, son. And he took him over to Psalms 1835. Thy gentleness hath made me great. The gentleness of God. You know why you got a good marriage tonight? Because of God. You know why you have a good church tonight? Because of God. God's gentleness. God's kind to you. He talks about over in Paul line, being, uh, being gentle as a father, and he comes to you. And even, even though we, we, we deserve punishment, and even though sometimes as Christians we deserve a lashing, and God said, I'm going to show you some kindness. I'm going to show you some gentleness. And I come around, and, and I, meet, I meet some of these guys, and, and, and they come in from all walks of life, and uh, I, I met some of these guys. I meet some of these girls. And I probably had about 2,500 come to my door. And it breaks my heart to see where they go. I'll see them around the country in churches. I'm never unkind to them. I'm never unkind to them. I'll say, anything I can do for you? How are things going? Well, I know things are going bad. Sometimes I see a girl with a black eye. She didn't fall down and get it. Somebody gave it to her. Now, you hit a woman, there's something, there's something wrong with your brain. So you need to fall down about five times. Or somebody pushing you down in Jesus' name. I don't think you should say that. Well, I'm six foot eight. I say what I want to say. Amen. And uh, uh, I, 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 I get these guys from all walks of life, and I get this boy in. And uh, this young man came in my, in my dorm many years ago. And uh, I kicked him out three times because of his mouth. He had a filthy mouth. He's hard. He's, he's, uh, he's manipulating people and hurting. And I took him back three times. And a good friend of mine, and uh, you remember Fred Sanford? Dun, 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 dun. Well, this guy reminded me of Fred Sanford. Him and Lamont, amen. Come on, folks. Come on. I know you watch it. It's funny. And uh, but the, 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 this Christian guy, you need to help this kid, Brother Potter. You need to give him one more chance. I brought this thinking kid back. And the time I brought him back in Othello, he broke. He got right with God. 
he starts weeping and he starts going soul winning and he starts passing out tracts and we're traveling on the road and we're preaching in New York and we're traveling doing mission work and I'm sending him up there. He's catching those 15 pound salmon on the Snake River. And he, I said, I said, uh, I said, Evan, why don't you go to Jack Cleaver's college and let him polish you up? He said, I can't go to college. I said, Evan, the mouth you got, you'll go places. Well, he believed me. Well, he went down to college. We put him in college and so forth. That was 12 years ago. He runs the largest Sunday school now in, in Brother Cleaver's uh, uh, church. He's now a, a elected deacon at the Dr. Cleaver's church. He supports missionaries all over the world because somebody gave him one more chance and brought him in. He still gets on my nerves, but I love him. <laughs> you got them that way too. I love him, but oh my goodness. And, uh, and, and and you get him in, you get him in, and, and one, one, the other day he called me and said, Brother Patterson, you wouldn't believe it. I got a guy in my Sunday school. He acts just like me. I said, amen, amen, amen. Payback is rough. <laughs> I got a guy come in one time, and he, uh, uh, you know, he, <laughs> Uh, he's, uh, he's, he said, look, brother, he said, he said, I, 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 I'm, I, I want to help. I want to do something for God. I want I want to do something. And I said, well, what? I said, uh, I said, I, I know a place out in the state of Washington and, and, uh, and this guy used to build houses for the mob. He can, he can build. And he goes out there and he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, he said, they want me to go to the Philippines. I said, for what? They, they want me to go help in an orphanage. I said, go to the Philippines and help them. Do you know if you went to Hawaii right now, there's over 7,000 tent people living in tents in Hawaii because they can't get home because they spent their money on dope. But they don't show you that on NBC and ABC and CBS. That's not too pretty. So I send this guy over to, to Alaska. They send him over to the Philippines. He gets over there in this church. He's 45 years old. He built houses for the mob, and I brought him out of a New York jail. And he got a tooth missing. I said, uh, I said, Bruce, you'll never get a wife with a tooth missing. Hey, brother, I'm going to get a wife, brother, from the Philippines. He goes over to the Philippines, and he meets this girl. Well, he's 45, and she's 35. And the pastor had some scruples about him. He said, do you want to date my girl? Let me sit down. And let me watch you for six months. You can't even talk to my dog unless I know who you are. That alone you, is a girl in the church. My man, Peanut, that's my dog. That's my bodyguard. He's my German Shepherd Chihuahua. He's looking for a wife. And uh, he gets over there, Brother Beatty, and he, and he, and he gets in the Philippines, and he, uh, <laughs> and he sees his girl, and he sets in the church. He starts helping the church. We're fixing the church up. Pastor comes to him in three months. He says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you marry my girl in my church. They get married. And they're cutting through the jungles of the Philippines. They see three kids sleeping under leaves and bamboos in the jungle. They'd just been married a few days. So when we take these kids home and take them to our home, they didn't have a home. He built a, uh, like a, a wind shelter. That was home. That was eight years ago. Somewhere in Manila. Manila. They say you can, Manila is so bad, you can smell Manila 30,000 feet in the air. That's how bad it smells. That's how nasty it is. But somewhere there's an old boy named Bruce Hunsacker. Look him up on Facebook. He's a missionary over there, and he's, and he's winning people to Christ and building an orphanage for kids that don't have nothing. You know what sometimes God had to do to me? He had to teach me to learn how to deal gently with them. Some of you moms and dads, you're not, you're not getting along with each other. Learn to deal gently with each other. I wonder why my daughter don't listen. I wonder why my because you don't deal gently with them. Sometimes it's just showing them some kindness. I didn't say let them off the hook. I just said this, this, the way your approach and the way your appeal is. You will listen to me. Yeah, she will listen to me when she's out that door. The only power I have over young people is influence. I was in Detroit the other night about 3 in the morning and uh, black area. And uh, I'm over there. And they say, hey, man, what you doing over here, blood? I say, hey, homeboy, you got it. What's up? They say, man, you talk like you know where you at. I said, well, I know I grew up here. Well, why you sound like a redneck? I said, well, that's where I, I was raised at. I wasn't born. I was born in Detroit, south side of Detroit. And for about two hours, I went out and bought about 100, 100 cheeseburgers from McDonald's. Wendy's was closed. And uh, McDonald's out there. I, I, I don't mind eating the beef. I just want to know where the beef come from. <laughs> Am I the only one in here that thinks that? Hello. I don't want no beef from Chinga Chama Chuma Chuma uh, 
somewhere we're overseas. I got over there, and all of a sudden, these people start singing a, a Christian song with me. I was watching my back. I, I thought I was going to get shot. And then I was out there with some other people. I stayed out there for about three hours, giving them Kool-Aid, chicken noodle soup, and cheeseburgers. They got in the line to come up to me and say something to me. I said, we've never seen this happen. I said, white people don't come into my neighborhood. I said, well, I grew up here. I grew up in those projects right there. I said, Jimmy Hoffa used to drop off turkeys and hams at Thanksgiving and Christmas time. I was about eight, nine years old. My dad was a drunk. Hey, we had 10 kids. My mom had 10 kids. And he looked at me and said, can I have a card? I still have cards and phone numbers from people on the streets. That was seven years ago. They're looking for someone to deal gently with them. To deal gently with them. I got a guy uh, come in and I had Brother Olaf's work many years ago, and Brother Olaf called me in. He said, Jack, I need to see you uh, in the morning. I want you to bring, uh, I want you to bring Teddy in. And long story short, uh, we bring this guy in, and, and uh, Brother Olaf looks this guy over, and he says, uh, I heard you just got out of prison, huh? He said, yeah. He said, well, why is the mob looking for you? He said, well, I didn't tell you everything. I did some things wrong to the mob, and they got a contract on me. And uh, this guy came to town to find this boy. And he finds him on the end of the coast of Canal fishing. He takes a picture of him through a scope. He takes a picture and sends a picture to Brother Olaf. He said, I called my, he said, he called Brother Olaf. He said, I called my mother today. And I told her I was in Corpus Christi, Texas. She said, oh, you got to go hear Brother Olaf preach. That's my hero. He said, oh, mama, oh, whatever. But he didn't, he, mother didn't know what, what, the, what the boy was doing. He was there to put a hit on the kid. And he said, gave the picture to Brother Olaf, sent it to him. And he had a picture circled. And then the next morning when I got to Brother Olaf's office, I, want, I, I knew why he wanted me there because I was standing next to this kid on the pier at nighttime pulling in speckled trout off the intercoastal. And this is what the kid told Brother Olaf, the man. He said, let so-and-so not to come back to a certain city for three years. After three years, he can go back. Well, you know, tragedy don't stop, don't stop anybody. It'll take truth to change you. I said, it'll take truth, not, not tragedy. This guy goes back to, to the city in Georgia, gets in trouble, and the, his, his wife you know, uh, took her own life, and this guy ends up in a mental ward. Brother Olaf had already died and gone on a plane crash in December, November 2nd, 82. I was coming back in December to, to be with him. And this young man was in a, in a, in a, in a Minnesville uh, mental ward in, in Dalton, in, uh, in Minnesville, Georgia, and he calls a preacher. Brother Olaf says, if I die and you're in trouble, I want you to call Jack Howes or I want you to call uh, Lee Robinson. And he calls Dr. Lee Robinson and tells him his story, what I just uh, somewhat in detail what I told you. He said, young man, when you get out of the, the, uh, the mental ward, I want you to come see me. My office will be open. They'll be waiting for you. About two weeks later, this kid walks in. Now he's 40, 45 years old. And he walks in and talks to Dr. Robinson. He needed someone to deal gently with him. Not to crush him. He goes in there, and long story short, Brother Brady, Dr. Robinson puts his whole life back together. He had a hit coming from the mob coming after him. His wife commits suicide, hangs herself, is in the mental ward. And Dr. Robinson puts this guy's life back together. He asked him a question. He said, son, he said, uh, what do you think God wants you to do with your life? He said, I know what God wants me to do. He wanted me to preach the gospel, but I, me I messed up my life so much. He said, well, there's something for you to do, son. God has something for you to do. He said, what's that? He said, I know some jails all over Georgia and Tennessee that has no preacher. And I'm looking for a young man that would go to those jails and preach the gospel on Saturday morning and Sunday morning. That young man, I'll see him next week. He's about 75 now. And for the next 20 years, the next 20 years, that's exactly what this guy did. He hit those jails, Brother Beatty, on Saturday, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and I'll see him for the second he came to my brother's funeral. My brother Jimmy was an Agent Orange, a Vietnam vet. They forgot to tell the guy they were spraying poison while they were in the jungle, and that's what he died of.
And I looked at Teddy and I said, how's it been? He said, it's, one, it's been one of the greatest rides I've ever had in my life. See, I'm trying to tell you, you're going you're gonna to meet people during Thanksgiving and Christmas time that you don't want to talk to. And they need a message from you. Deal gently with the young man for my sake. And sometimes they get out there in the midnight hour and, and uh, the funds are low and then everything's going, the vehicle's breaking down. And I said, Lord, sometimes I just tell God, hey, Lord, this is just for you. This is just for you. This is just for you. When I had that goofy raid, all that got worked out. It was all bogus and everything else. I got it all paid. Even the sheriff of that town begged me to stay. and said, Jack, I need you here. You're the only light that we have in your area. Two weeks ago, there was a drug raid in the same town in Empire, Alabama. 3,000 people. They confiscated all the drugs and hair. Look it up online, Empire of the Mama. $172,000 of counterfeit money. That's what's going on in a little drug town in Alabama. I go to the gas station. Hey, preacher, how you doing? You still here? Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. In and out. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Deal gently with them. Deal gently with them. I got little I got little nephews right now, great nephews in the in the, in the gangs in Detroit. I remember the first time I saw gang signs. I didn't know what it was. I said, "What's this guy doing?" I thought they were epileptic, you know. No, oh, you know, and it's a joke, man. It's funny. And uh, it, it was up in Chicago, and uh, up up at the, uh, I was the director there at Pacific Garden Mission, and I went I went in that bar list. Now, when you get barred from a rescue mission, your cheese fell out of your sandwich. Hello, a rescue mission? You can They won't let you in. Uh, gee, Wally, hello. <laughs> And my goal was to get everybody off of that list. I got everybody off that list except one guy. And he got murdered in the park. His name is Don. Many years later, many years later, I went back to preach at that mission. And I saw a guy over here that I knew back at the mission days back in the 80s. And I got in when I was 19, 18. I, I started preaching in 1971. And I've been at it ever since. Uh, February will be 50 years. I ain't quitting. I may be iron. Remember iron side. I may be iron side on a chair, but I ain't quitting. Amen. And uh, but and I'm preaching to myself tonight. Sometimes I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of giving the message to give it to them. Get it. 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 I had a guy come in many years ago, and and uh, he wouldn't stop smoking. And I said, man, I said, you, you, I'm, I'm going to get you on them cigarettes. I charge them money. I take away their freedom. I take away their visits, whatever. I just whatever I take. And uh, finally, he told me, he said, man, I need to get right with God. And he said, I want to go to Bible school. He goes off to Bible school. And I didn't hear from him for about eight or nine years. He got a hold of me years ago. And he said, hey, Brother Patterson, he said, I want you to come preach for me in Hawaii. I said, who are you over there with Magnum P.I.? What are you doing over there? He said, no, he said, I got right with God, and, and I left your home. I went to uh, Bible school, Dr. Mickey Carter School, and he said, I'm a missionary now in one of these islands in, in, uh, in Hawaii. I said, wow, really? He said, I said, well, what do you got going? He said, well, I work at a church. I got a men's home. I have about 25 guys. He said, I'm doing exactly how you taught me. I didn't teach him, but he was watching. They're watching you. They're watching you. They're listening. He said, I got something. There's two states I have never preached in, Dr. Beatty. Alaska, Sarah Palin country. I like that woman. And uh, uh, she knows what she believes in, and Hawaii. But when I get those two states, I have all states. Pre I preach. That's a little preacher boy thing I have in my own life. What I'm saying to you is this. Deal gently with them for my sake. If I don't keep my motive right for Christ, me helping people will come to naught. My motive, for my sake. For my sake. Hey, Joab, when you find my boy, deal gently with him. Hey, you go at work and they're unkind, deal gently with him. Deal gently with him. Deal gently with him. Deal gently with him. I got a, I got a job at uh, Blown Ox. I used to make the arm, armored tanks, the old M60 tanks. And I, was, I, was a, I grew up in a machine factory. I knew how to run machines. And I got into this place. And this guy named Big Tony's from Russia. Blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he had about five teeth missing, and he, and he spoke Russian, so he was old, and plus his lips were moving the wrong way, and he's got these uh, broken teeth. I couldn't understand what he was saying. And so he kept saying, Makata, Makata. I, I thought he said, draw the, the Carter. He said, no, he's talking about Douglas MacArthur. 
is one of my heroes. So were George Patton. And uh, so I, I said, I know a lot about Douglas MacArthur. And uh, oh, yes, I said, I said, if it wasn't for MacArthur, you'd be speaking German. Hello. <laughs> That's a church history joke. Come on. You see, history is his story. It's his story. And that guy found out that I like Douglas MacArthur, a young kid coming in to work going to Bible school. He said, uh, he said you're going you're gonna to take you six months how to run these bearings on these tanks. He said, you come here in three days, I'll show you how to shortchange short everything. Within three days, I was doing stuff for three days. Guys couldn't do with it, working there for three months. He showed me how to put these bearings in, make sure to spin around and work. And, and, and I was going to work there another several years. He retired out. And, uh, and I mean, I try to win that guy and win that guy. You know why he liked me? He said, you listen when I talk to you. When, when the young people and people hurting are talking to you, listen to them. Listen to them. Hey, when you find my son Absalom, when you find Absalom, deal gently with him for my sake. And by the way, in the Old Testament, it was, it was a death wish when you broke a king's commandment. It was a death wish. Talk to Daniel about that, Nebuchadnezzar. But they killed this young man. They killed this young man. And then he said, is, is the young man safe? Is the young man safe? Hey, when you're out of the will of God, you're not safe doing nothing. Hey, you know, that's the first thing I do. I make sure I'm, I'm a good account. My pastor is Brother Chris Staub. I tithe there. I, we give the missions there and everything else. And I like to hear his preaching. I like to hear the air and so forth. Well, that costs something. That's, what, that's, that's how you get things moving and get things going. And uh, again, why is it people with money have no vision? People with vision have no money. We go to church there and so forth. I put my, I put my guys there. They're coming in to work there. And I'm trying to start another home with the Amish. I got two Amish guys that uh, come under me 20 years ago. I, I did some work to keep them out of prison for a long, a long term and so forth. And uh, both of them snubbed me for about a year. But I kept going back and kept going back and kept going back. Don't let the world outdo you. I like boxing. Dun, dun, roll, roll, you're Rocky Balboa. No, I, I, like, uh, I like Rocky Marciano, though. I like uh, uh, the, the Brown Bomber, Joe. I like, I like those guys that know how to suffer. I'm not going to let a lost guy outdo me. Why are you letting the lost people outdo God's people? Getting quiet here. I got a cold. I better stay home. You stay home from work? Well, I got a hallelujah on that one. What I'm trying to say to you is, man, I want to take the things of God, and I want to. I got a young. I got a young man right. He's probably watching tonight. He and his, he and his mother used, ran. Uh, I, I get it mixed up. I'm getting old. I blame that. But they they used to they used to do meth together. He's about five foot five. He weighs about three sixty. I said, Tommy, you're gonna have to lose some weight. You want an Amish girl? You better get with the program. I just, I, I, it's cold. Quit eating, <laughs> okay? And I've lost about sixty pounds. So I'm gonna take off another fifty, and um, but because well, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. Now only if, I'm only in this because I can't stand because of my legs with the neuropathy from my spine. He comes home. He goes back home and leads his mom to Christ. Tommy quit school and dope. He went to Bible school. Gets his mom saved. He calls me. I preacher said, "My mom's got cancer. She's gonna die. What do I do?" They're, they're, they're going to let some guy here at the, at the funeral home say something. I said, don't let him. You preach your mother's funeral. And you preach the gospel of Christ. He called me back about an hour later. He said, Brother Jack, you'll never guess what happened. Huh, surprised me. He said, 21 people trusted Christ as their Savior. I said, 21 people trust Christ. By the way, he went through my program about nine times. He's fighting with everybody. He had a mouth. He's fighting here. He's got little man syndrome. It's always a little guy who wants to beat on the big guy. You touch me, I'll change your life. That's all that matters. You know, it's two and two is four and four and four is, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I take care of my wife's, my wife's husband. And, uh, and he said, but Brother Jack, he said, he said, he said I, I was so mean and so mad at life. I didn't like the way God made me. Ah, that's the inner problem. You got something wrong on the inside. A lot of times the preachers and everything else are attacking things on the outside. No, the outside is a picture of the inside. 
You'll catch that letter wrong. Boy, this is deep. I deal with them all the time. Why would a guy want to walk around with an earring in his nose? Yo, what's up? Not you. You make them, I make fun of people. Hey, they say, hey, man, how's the weather up there? I say, watch out, it's fixing to rain. <laughs> you know, they say the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Yeah, to watch out, the smaller you are, the farther you fly. <laughs> I have a sense of humor with you. I, got, I, I was at the police station the other day. No, I was just picking up somebody. And the guy said, hey, Reverend, we need to have you here, man. You're a riot. I said, well, they had me preaching to, uh, I think, uh, uh, 150 uh, uh, federal prisoners in Michigan. And he said, we don't have any guard to protect you. I said, I got the Holy Ghost. He said, you got who? I said, I got the Holy Ghost. Amen. And uh, one of my buddies come in there, and he was about 5'4". I said, well, you ain't much help. Hey, man, God bless you. I'm over there preaching. And they're all staring you down. I said, oh, my goodness. And they're, they're, I want some Zimbabwe and Egypt. They're, all, they're, they're, they're federal agents from all over the world, and they want me to preach to them. And I'm in there. They had, you have to sit down on this chair to sit down. And that's before I had my accident. And they're all just staring at me. And so I kind of got flushed. I said, do you guys like what you're looking at? And they're like, bugga, 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 bugga. They're all talking. They're like, I don't understand what they're saying. What the problem was, they didn't understand what I was saying. That's what they were looking at. And they said, one guy said, we've never seen a white guy this big before. That's what we're looking at. So I got rid of my insecurity and I preached to them. And those guys stood up in that, in that room and clapped and begged me to come back next Sunday, the next Sunday, the next Sunday, the next Sunday. They're from all over the world. They're from all over the world. It's a federal prison. And this church has an input. And they bring in about uh, 12 people every Sunday to minister to the whole prison. Every time I walk out of there, whew, wish I could stay. See, you gotta, you've got to get in mind that somebody, somebody needs you this, th th this year. Um, the wheels are done. I'm surfing the field. And... Uh, Brother Olaf got a guy many years ago, and before I tell you that, let me tell you this one. I'll tell you two stories. I'm done. I'm getting hungry. Every time I swallow, my stomach says, thank you. I uh, got a call from California. Someone said, California is like Raisin Bran cereal. Get rid of the fruits and the nuts. All you have left is a bunch of flakes. <laughs> Come on, man. That's a Raisin Bran joke. Come on. And uh, this, girl's, this girl's calling me, and she knows me from another church. And she said, Brother Patterson, she said, uh, I'm a deacon's daughter of such and such independent Baptist church. And she said, I'm on heroin, and these boys are using me, whatever. Use your own imagination, taking advantage of her, using her, pimping her off. I said, well, you need to get out of that situation. And I said, why are you calling me? She said, because you know people. You can help me. I said, yeah, I'll do what I can to help you. I said, what are you hearing? She said, I, they don't know I speak Spanish. And she said, they're talking about taking my body parts and selling them into Mexico, taking my liver, taking my lungs, taking my, everything out and selling my, my, my heart. I said, as soon as you get off the phone with me, I want you to run out of the motel and run as fast as you can wherever there's traffic at and get on the phone and call the cops. I never met this girl. I still haven't met her. She runs. She finds a cop. She tells him what I just told you. They busted the guys. The trafficking. I know how to fix trafficking. They don't like it, but I know how to fix it. Long story short, they put her in a home, a woman's home. She gets cleaned up. She gets right with God. She goes off to Bible school. She meets a guy. She marries him. They're in the ministry somewhere today. I see her on Facebook. I don't even know her. I couldn't even tell you her name. I had my wife counsel her, give her some ideas. This was 10 years ago. All she needed was someone just to encourage her. She was fixing, they were going to sell her body parts. And my wife heard that. She said, let, let, let me talk to that girl. They're all over the place. You'd be surprised what's going on in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You'd be surprised. 
and you can't be afraid of them. You better, you better carry those gospel tracks out of there. And uh, I, I, I tell you this, I'm, I'm going to change my message. I went to that hospital, uh, uh, Muslim hospital, and hospital food is nasty. I, I said it's nasty. It, it's, you know, I, I don't eat it. So I, I got a fan club. I'm on Facebook. Yo, some of you fan people coming in by Popeye's, bring me some sandwiches. I want the spicy kind. I, I did. I did say that. And so they got they got hamburger, they got the chicken coming in, they got the beans and rice coming in, and they got pizza coming in. I, I, I didn't mean to eat it, but it just, every, I mean, first bite was a half moon, second bite was a total eclipse. It was gone. It was gone. And, uh, but uh, I had the operation. Oh, my goodness. I can't eat that stuff. So, but I took 140 gospel tracks, Brother Beatty, in there with me, and my goal was to get rid of every, every one of them. And had these tracks in my church. I said, do you know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And my goal was to get every, every track, a Muslim doctor and a Muslim nurse, and that hospital a gospel track. When they walked in my room, they had my Bible, had my snacks hid over here, you know, Snack and Jack, they were calling me Snack and Jack. And, uh, and so I had, I had all these tracks over here, and all of a sudden, when, before they all leave, they would say, can I have one of those? Yes, take it with you. And all of a sudden, other nurses start coming back in. Hey, do you, do you have something about God? Yes, here you go. I didn't beat them up. I didn't make fun of them. I had some books there too. I had, I had, I had the life story of George Patton. I read, I read history. And uh, if you want to be a leader, you got to be a reader. And, uh, and I read it. And he came in and took a picture of it. I want to take a picture of that book, Patton's Principles. Now, it's kind of rough. Women don't read it, but it's kind of rough. And it has some rough adjectives. And uh, he took a picture. And he kept coming every day, to this, this medical doctor. He said, what changed you? What changed you, Mr. Patterson? I said, a little Jew that died on Calvary. A little Jew? Who, a Jew? Who? Jesus. Ah, Yeshua. Yes, Yeshua. Tell, tell me about him. What do you believe about him? We, we, we were told that he died at two hours old on the cross. I said, no, no. He died 33 years old and a half on the cross. And he was the son of God. He died and went to hell and came back up the third day according to the scriptures. The scripture's not going to break. According to the scriptures. And that doctor, when I left, when I left Brother Beatty, every one of those tracks, I never raised my voice. When they come in, by the way, they wanted me up at 8 in the morning. I was up at 6.30, showered and ready to go. Because why? It was preaching time. I'm a, they're going to work me. And them old people kind of there, man, hey, Mr. Patterson, let's get off that bed, you big wimp. They were just getting in your face. These are women. I didn't know what part was you know, Adam, what part was Eve, but uh, they, they were rough. And uh, they had muscles on them. They are going to beat me up, you know. And, and uh, I stopped one girl. I said, man, you're, I'm going to call you the bulldog. You're the bulldog. And she, he calls me the bulldog. That was her nickname and so forth. And when I left, they all lined up, about 20 of them clapping said, you were the best patient we've had here in years. Laughing, high-fiving me. Of course, I bought them all about 10 pizzas before I left. Amen. Had, had to buy them off a little bit. Amen. Use your head. The woodpecker does. Amen. God bless you. And But uh, what I'm going to say to you, deal gently with them. Deal gently with them for my sake. You want someone to be kind to your kids? Won't you be kind to someone else's kids? Be kind to your pastor. The last time you wrote your pastor a nice note, Lie to him. Tell him he preaches good. Be kind to him. Encourage him. Hey, preacher, I love you, man. Appreciate you. And then write down what he did for you. Maybe write something down in the message. I wish my preacher was here tonight. He's gone. He got killed in the plane crash. He told Brother Cameron, this is going to be the best day of my life. At 8, 8.30, at 10.30, it was the best day of his life. He went home to glory. I got... Many, I got hundreds of illustrations I can tell you tonight. I think you get the point tonight. I like it, Brother Law said, we need some porcupine preachers so the people get the point. But God bring people across your path. They're in the motels, they're at Hardee's, they're at the gas station. i tell you one more and I'm, I'm done. I was at the gas station many years ago. This guy I told you about uh, uh, in the Philippines, this, this German boy. Named Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Hunsaker. And um, well, he had just started learning how to win souls to Christ, how to, how to, how to talk. He didn't, he didn't know all the jargon. Well, if you know, if he died today, be sure if you, you go to heaven. And 
get your little line, you know, line it out. And uh, he, would, he was blunt. Hey, you want to go to heaven? Stay out of hell? <laughs> I said, Bruce, we, we, we got to polish you up a little bit, brother. And, uh, and so we, he passed our track. Well, I, I'm over there at the, ga- over the gas, and he's, and he's talking to this guy from Morocco. And Bruce is talking to him. And he's got, he built houses for the mob. He just, for the New York, you know, Donald Trump. That's just the way they talk. You can't get offended that, you know, if you got thin skin, New Yorkers will get in your face. Forget about it, you know. Listen to Rudy Giuliani talk. And then, uh, but I get up there, and Bruce is over there with this guy. And last time, and then and, and, and all of a sudden, uh, this this guy goes into the, the, the guy who's talking to Bruce goes inside the gas. I'm filling up the gas station. And I'm, and all of a sudden, I'm coming into the, I mean, my, 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 my van, I'm walking into the uh, gas station to use the restroom. Or something. He said, hey, said, who's that guy over there, that Mediterranean guy? I said, why? He said, he just told me I was going to hell if I didn't get saved. I said, what? He, I said, he told you that? Well, he's telling you the truth. And I went back out there and talked to Bruce. I said, Bruce, that guy went and told that proprietor if he didn't, you see, that's what I told him. If he wouldn't get, if he wasn't saved, he's going to go to hell. He bottles his head. And by the way, uh, uh, I forget his name, uh, Mamoon, Mamoon. And the name means believer. And that old German led that boy to Christ. And before we left, we got to see him witness to his first convert. I like that. There's some Christians in this room here, you ain't witnessed for Christ in 10 years. But you want them to answer your prayer. You know, when you'll get right with God when that phone rings at midnight, baby's got a fever. Dad's had a stroke. Hello. I get a lot of those phone calls. But I'm glad. Now, look, I'm not telling the stories I, I, I flubbed up on. I know sometimes I ask the Lord, can you give me another chance to rectify that? Can I, can I help that out? There's people need you here in this town. I want to encourage you to learn. I'm done preaching. Get you some tracks, put them in your pocket. Carry him with them. My brother Jimmy, he was a Vietnam War hero. He was a he was a a, a Vietnam uh, uh, they captured him, Viet Cong cat, and they were t- torturing him. And the only reason why my brother was alive is the 25th Infantry rescued him. They were ruthless. They would cut the ears off the enemy and wear them around their neck. Those guys rescued. That's all right. That's all right. Enemy, I said. Enemy. You go to war, you war. You want to be a pansy? Stay home. And my brother was rescued by those guys. He got saved under Dr. Beecham Vick. He come to me one time, Brother Beatty, he says, uh, he says, Jack, what's all this soul winning stuff? What, what, what's all this soul winning stuff? You want to win souls of Christ? What's that all about? I said, well, Jim, you got to uh, pass out tracts and tell people. And this guy was a man's man. He wasn't loud or boisterous. Uh, he was a Vietnam vet. He worked. He bought his houses, raised his kids, right? And he called me up on the phone one day. He said, hey, Jack, I'm doing it. I said, what are you doing? I mean, this, this guy was a street kid. I mean, you didn't mess with him. He said, I got a sign on my shop at the factory. It says, only take one free of charge. Thank you. That was his sign he put up himself. Oh, he thought, so proud of that sign. And what he did, he had 100, he had 100 pieces of gospel tracks uh, up, up, up there, and he had a whole stack of them. He said, at the end of the day, they'd be all gone. That was his way of witnessing. Yay. At least he did something. He, wouldn't, he didn't have no silent witness. He wasn't no Nicodemus. Only came to Jesus when no one else was looking. If you're in here somewhere, Nicodemus, I told my brother, I said, uh, you were my hero on the streets, and you're still my hero. He said, Jack, preach my funeral. He said, uh, preach to the lost, but go after the Christians. My other brother died. Told me the same thing. He said, Jack, I got you saved. Now when I die, I preach Christ. Preach Christ. My sister said, Jack, talk, talk, talk about heaven, but talk about hell. My mother, when she died, before she died, she called me in. She said, uh, I, I don't want none of this uh, 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 su- su- sweet little nuggets. I want you to preach the hell out of them. That's what my mother said. She grew up in the projects. 
I preach Christ. My dad got me one night. He said, Jack, he said, I lived a rough life, son. Here's the baby boy having to preach all the funerals. My dad said, uh, Jack, he said, I knew Mr. Hoffa. I did deals for him. I worked for him. He said, when you got saved, you did something for the family. And uh, before my dad died, uh, the nurse recorded something. We got back to the hospital. My dad had passed away. He said, Jack, I want you to come home and take your mom and take them all home. And I want you to come and tell me about heaven as I think I'm going to cross over tonight. My dad was a mean man, but remember the lamb came in. <laughs> the lamb came in that dog. And all of a sudden, this lady had a, had a recorder on with the, with the hospital. When the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there to God. I'll see him again. I'm going to see him when we get over on the, on the other side of Chile, Jordan. And it, it's soon we're going home. We're going, I have no doubt about it. We're going home. But before that, that buzz that hits off, I don't, I, I, don't want no, I don't want to flatline out. I want to win that boy to Christ. I want to win that girl to Christ. I told you, I don't know if I told you tonight, I got a call today from the fellow Washington, the, the place I had 20 years ago with, with, uh, with 15 houses on there and, uh, and, and five dormitories. That's where Agape boarding school started. I gave that to them. Said, we want to give it back to you free of charge. I said, man, I'm, I'm knocking on the door. 70, go get some young bucks. He said, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. You got work to do, folks. But your formula, how to, how to get it done? You, you know how to deal with that grouch at work? You be kind to it. 